but I'm going to take the high road and start with uh, the President's farewell speech tonight. And joining me are two people who, uh, who have been following this, who know a bit about it. First, Bruce Hawker. I was going to say political veteran, but you were at the Democratic Convention. Uh, I was. A few months ago. And as I said, this could be the last time you see a really uplifting Democrat <laughs> president speak for a while, or any president. I'm going to savour those times. <laughs> uh, it, it could be quite a while before we get that warm feeling that we got then. I heard the commentators in the US saying, well, we won't hear oratory like that for four years. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's true. And joining us from the Canberra Press Gallery, Bernard Keane of crikey.com.au. Hello, Bernard. Good day, Janine. Did you, were you able to drag yourself away from the local scandals to watch President Obama today? Uh, I did. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't one of his great speeches, but um, uh, there's a, there was a certain... Hey, it's a low well, bar a pretty, these pretty days. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. Um, it was, a, you know, obviously pretty elegiac uh, in tone. Um, but, look, this is a guy who... I, I've got a lot of criticisms to make of Barack Obama, but domestically, uh, in terms of, of, of the economy of the United States, he has done an enormous amount for Americans, and I don't really think they fully Appreciate. understand quite how much he's, 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 he's done for them. And, they uh, will learn. And I think look, in... You were going to say... In and, and, look, and, and, look, and, look, yeah, and, look, I think this, this is... History, I think, is going to be... Going to be history is harsh to some presidents and, and kind to others, and oftentimes neither is justified, but I think history is going to be justifiably kind to uh, Barack Obama in terms of the economy, because... Uh, uh, his achievements there were significant and the kind of things that flow through to changing people's lives. And I think th that, was, that was one of the themes he was touching on today. OK, well, we've got a couple of the grabs here. Just uh, here's some samplings of what he said and then we'll go to our panel's highlights. In 10 days, the world will witness a hallmark of our democracy. No, 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 no. The peaceful transfer of power from one freely elected president to the next. <laughs> Democracy does require a basic sense of solidarity. The idea that for all our outward differences, we're all in this together, that we rise or fall as one. Without a willingness to admit new information and concede that your opponent might be making a fair point and that science and reason matter, then we're going to keep talking past each other and we'll make common ground and compromise impossible. We're going to uh, go to favourite parts of the speech. You notice I went for the more uplifting stuff because we're going to get down in the dirt when we get to the other bloke soon. So, um, not his fault, I will say. But, uh, Bruce, what were your highlights there? I'm with, uh, I'm with Bernard. I thought the opening where he said, who would have thought years ago that the economy and we reversed a recession had the greatest run of jobless? We saved the auto industry. They were great achievements. Yeah, they were, and I think he will be remembered for them. I mean... I think people forget quickly how desperate the situation was in 2008. You know, we didn't know where the world was going. We certainly didn't know where the United States was going. And, uh, and if you travelled through the States in 2008, 2009, you saw the devastation where entire communities were, were just emptied out by people who walked away from their homes, who couldn't pay the, the mortgages anymore. And, uh, and he's turned that around, and, and he's got to be given credit for that. That's an incredible achievement. And if that was all, that would be enough, pretty well. That would well. be enough. <laughs> uh, and, of course, you know, Obamacare, well, uh, you know, we would look down our nose at, at something as, as piddling as that here, if I may use the word. Uh, oh, you may. It's <laughs> going to come up again. <laughs> uh, but in, uh, in, in terms of the American social security system, that's an incredible achievement. And he had an interesting comment on that where he said, look, if you can come up with something better, I'll, I'll champion I'll, it myself. I'll back it in. I mean, yeah. that was interesting, wasn't it? I mean, the overall tone, Bernard, he obviously did try and take, uh, as Michelle said, the high road, didn't he, today? It was all warm and, you know, he resisted the, the opportunity to have too big a go at any, uh, anybody on the other side? Yeah, he made a couple of trenchant points. One, of course, is that uh, this idea about uh, the echo chambers and, uh, and science and reason being abandoned uh, as part of public discourse. They're pretty important points. I think what's going to be interesting is the role that, that Obama plays post-presidency 
and how much of an uh, you know of a of a oppositional figure he is going to be. Now, the tradition in the United States, of course, is that presidents back each other. They 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 will provide support for the incumbent, even if it's of the other party. And uh, we've uh, the George W. Bush has uh, has been quite close to the Obamas, for example, uh, as well as the um, as well as the. Clintons. Well, we're going to get to the um, new president and the issues in just a minute. On that, it will be uh, yes, it will be interesting to see what the relationships like. I think everyone will probably want a distance. But just back to the speech today, um, Bernard said it, you know it wasn't one of his greatest. But I, I heard the American commentators pointed out for all his oratory and and the feeling when he came in. None of his speeches, he doesn't have those great lines, there's not a particular line. They're all good, but nothing soared. Well, uh, it's a, in today's spe uh, speech, I think that's right. That he has given some marvellous speeches in his time, particularly when he was running for the presidency and the night that he, uh, that he was successful. I was in Washington that evening. It was just one of the great evenings of my life and I can only compare it so, uh, so miserably with the one that we just had uh, a few weeks ago when, he, when uh, Obama... When, uh, when Trump won. But... Uh, he is capable of great speeches, there's no doubt about that. But I think today was more of a reflective and moment the tone for him. Was and right. the tone had to be fitting that. Uh, it was not a, a great call to arms for him, but it was, I guess, a, a reminder that in Barack Obama you have somebody who is everything that Donald Trump is not. And again, we're going to get to that man in just a minute. But, Bernard, uh, there were even tears in the end. I mean, the fact is I've covered presidents since back to Ronald Reagan. He's certainly probably been the most dignified. I cannot think of a scandal of him personally or his wife, even the slightest thing. Y you'd have to say, as opposed to what might be ahead, dignified is certainly a word, and he went out with dignity, I thought. Oh, absolutely. Look, the, the in terms of scandal-free presidencies, well, I mean, George H.W. Bush was... was re I mean, lost. He only, only lasted one term, but he was reasonably scandal-free. The Clinton years were a byword for, for scandal. So dignity and grace, I think, are appropriate terms for a presidency that's been untainted by... Uh, anything like that, I mean... You say that about and, Bush, and but even Ronald of... Reagan had the Iran-Contra in his last term. I mean, everybody's exactly. had something. He... Exactly, and Barack Obama managed to get through, and the biggest thing was, uh, was this obsession with his birth certificate. I mean, <laughs> if that's the best you can do, then, uh, you know, that points to just what a different president and what a different presidency uh, he managed to achieve. And the first lady... I mean, the, the, um, Michelle Obama has been a... a you know, an outstanding first lady, and all in the face of the most unrelenting and often racist hostility from not just their political enemies, but a lot of people in the United States. It's been a, it's been a pretty, it's been a pretty remarkable achievement to keep your dignity and your grace uh, in that position under that pressure and in the Thank face you. of that kind of hatred. Bruce, you, you said you were there. I was there uh, when he was, in, uh, you know, at the inauguration in a park in San Francisco, and having covered the Reagan years in the US, I. I it, there, it was incredibly moving. Whichever side of politics you were on, there was this almost awe amongst people that no one expected in their lifetime to see a see black it, president. Yeah. The hopes were just too high, weren't they? <laughs> well, well, yes and no. I, I, I think the fact that he broke all those rules and still managed to be an accomplished president uh, suggests that they, you know, he, he didn't really fail in the presidency. I don't think we can say that. I mean, he, he was confronted with a hostile Congress. You don't think leading the way to a Donald Trump to take over is probably... But I that'll be his biggest failure, well, won't it? Well, you know, I'm not sure that you can hold him responsible for that. I mean, there was a lot of talk, uh, particularly on election night in, in the States, about a white lash in, in that there was a, a reaction from, you know, a, a lot of people who... Trump had given permission to you know, speak their, their, their mind on a whole raft of issues, and wow, wasn't that an ugly <laughs> insight into some people's heads? But, but so, so you know, I, I think the fact that he was black probably did give rise to some, you know, racist responses. Some people that wanted to reclaim America. But he said himself you know, also for... high expectations that this was going to be a post-racial America. He said we've still got huge problems. Oh well, it's clearly not that. I mean, it's getting worse. There's no no doubt about that. And and that's what is also remarkable because it, you know it is a time of growing prosperity. If they were 
diving into a, in a, into a terrible economic abyss now, you might be able to explain some of the tensions that are there much more clearly, but they're actually coming out of that period and they're doing it very well. They're probably doing it better than we are in, in, a, in, a, in a way here in Australia. So it never has really made a lot of sense to me that uh, the response of a lot of these people was, you know, pure populism. But, uh, you know, it's a very difficult creature to, to, to wrangle this populist thing. And it's going to be very interesting to see how the Democrats do it in the, in the coming four years because he'll be a tough character to deal with. He's still got a lot of, this is, uh, Trump, he's certainly got a lot of support still. Well, let's get to Donald Trump. And as Bernard just said, uh, the last two terms have been relatively scandal free, but uh, we still got a week till the inauguration, just over a week and more scandals, huge scandals today. Um, here's a summary of what actually happened. And it was unfortunate because while the emphasis all should have been on that lovely speech, no, there was another story vying with it, and this one for the front page. Here we go. It's Commander-in-Chief, a bombshell. It's been revealed that during a classified briefing last week, US intelligence officials told Trump about the existence of an unverified but potentially damaging dossier, mostly compiled by someone claiming to be a British former MI6 agent, now working as a private consultant. It alleges that the Russian government has been cultivating, supporting and assisting Trump for at least five years, among other things, feeding Trump and his team valuable intelligence on his opponents, including Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. It claims that Russian intelligence possesses compromising personal information on Trump, sufficient to be able to blackmail him, including recordings of graphic sexual acts that were gathered when he visited Russia. As is his habit, Trump almost immediately issued a tweet about the newly published allegations. Fake news, a total political witch hunt, he said. Nobody has sourced it. They're all unnamed, uh, un unspoken sources. According to the Guardian newspaper, the FBI applied for a special warrant to monitor four of Trump's team members suspected of irregular contact with Russian officials. Trump has always denied having any secret connection to Russia. But whatever the truth of the claims, they will dominate the coming days. A scandal the president-elect can ill afford. Hannah Thomas-Peter, Sky News in New York. See, that's just silly. A scandal he can ill afford. Scandals just go off in their Teflon. He's been elected. Doesn't matter now. Bernard, what do you make of this latest one? It's, it, I, I can't see that anything's going to have any impact, is it? Well, the idea that it somehow it's going to undermine his political, you know, d uh, detract from his political capital is pretty, pretty silly. Um, the guy's just got elected. He hasn't even been sworn in yet. Um, and let's put aside the salacious stuff. Um, not, don't put it totally aside because it's hilarious, but... Um, we'll get to it. The, I mean, th th this, is, this is an extraordinarily serious um, uh, set, of in uh, or set of claims and actions by the United States chief security agencies. Basically, they're saying the Russians have supported and cultivated and provided assistance to an American president-elect uh, with the idea of, of, of uh, damaging his opponents and encouraging him, uh, evidently because they believe he is going to be of much greater benefit to them than, uh, than his opponent. Uh, you know, there's, for a long time there's been this suggestion, but we've never been able to really nail it down, that Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin are somehow in cahoots. Well, you know, this is this is the beginning of, of hard information. From the FBI, by the way, not the CIA. The FBI is the is the is the outfit that, that has been alleged to be pro-Trump through the uh, throughout the uh, election campaign. But it's sure. the FBI raising the issue that that Trump's so some of Trump's senior staff have uh, improper contact sure. with um, with the Russians, and that's Bruce. that's that, that's the really important stuff here. Is this is this very very disturbing suggestion of you know highly improper contact between the highest, what will shortly be the highest office in America, and, and uh, a hostile power? But Bruce, there's been so much about this, and they don't seem to care. Do they? I mean, do you well, think, uh, is the, there a point, is there a tipping point? Because I don't think we're there yet, are we? Well, I don't think we are there, certainly on the salacious stuff. There's no doubt about that. But uh, I agree with Bernard that the, the real issue here is the cultivation alleged 
of key people in the uh, Trump camp. You know, he goes from being the Manhattan candidate to the Manchurian candidate, if any of this is true. And I think there is sufficient anxiety about you know, Russians in America for this to really start to bite in, in, not necessarily in the short term, but in the medium to longer term. And Bernard, just quickly on the other issue of this, do you think BuzzFeed was wrong? There's a lot of mistakes there. This is totally unverified. I mean, he does have a point, I mean, whether it's true or not, and I know it was there, but to just dump all this stuff, aren't, we, aren't they just being as bad as the other side with the allegations that, that could be just made up without verifying? I mean, a number, I, of, a number of news organisations did not touch it. Uh, they, 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 they are as bad as the other side, and that's the point. I mean, Donald, you know, when, when Donald Trump was campaigning, no lie was too egregious, no falsehood was too uh, outrageous for them to peddle if it helped Donald Trump and hurt Hillary Clinton. And now Donald Trump's complaining about fake news. I'm sorry, it doesn't go that way. He set the standard, uh, or, or more correctly, he destroyed the standard for what is acceptable in public discourse in US politics. For him to now turn around and complain that he's a victim of unsourced and unsubstantiated uh, material. Well, sorry, pal, but you had your chance there and you blew it a long time ago. So, See, I, I don't, um, I don't agree with Bernard on that one. I think that, yes, I mean, much as you would like to say, yes, well, you know, you reap what you sow, the fact is, I don't know, I'll take the Michelle Obama. When they go low, you're meant to go high. You're not meant to actually repeat the mistakes they make. Well, I think the Obamas will always go high, but there'll be people out there acting on behalf of the Democratic Party who'll be quite prepared to go low. And... And, and, and in a sense, why not? If they've, if they've torn up the rule book on these things, then it's very difficult to okay. expect the other side just to be uh, playing by, you know, the uh, halls, by, by, by the, um, you know, by the rules. By the rules. Uh, look, just because the rule book has been teared up, I never thought I would see this headline or hear American commentators today trying to explain what a golden shower is, but... This is what is happening because while we're talking about uh, those allegations of the sexual acts the Russians had, um, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, without putting people off their tucker, Bernard, any comment on the whole golden shower phenomenon? Um, no, not really. Look, no, I think what I think Donald, Trump, <laughs> Donald Trump's sexual preferences are, aren't uh, particularly um, relevant. It's the fact that he's allowed himself to be compromised by the Russians is more serious, I think, than, uh, than whatever sexual predilections he might have and, behind closed doors. And, Bruce, as I said, I mean, I think after the groping tape, he's, I don't think it's going to matter. He's taking it right out there. <laughs> so I don't think that's going to be the issue. It'll be whether he's been compromised, either personally or by association. OK, but... You've heard it all now. We will not be talking about that again. But as I said, they're very prudish on American television. It has been very amusing to watch them get their head around this one today. We're going to take a break and get back to our own scandals, which are not as salacious, but uh, interesting nonetheless. <laughs> Welcome back. Time to get to local politics. There's plenty happening here. It mightn't be as exciting as the US, but uh, exciting by our standards. I'm here with our panel tonight. Bruce Hawker, a Labor veteran campaign manager. Uh, Bernard Keane from crikey.com.au. And we'll be joined by someone from the press gallery. And as I say every night, they're all being run off their, their legs by things happening because right at the moment, uh, Rod Cullerton, the former One Nation senator who was declared bankrupt by the Federal Court in Western Australia three weeks ago, he's given a 21-day stay. He's now officially been removed from the Senate. He's no longer a senator, but that we still have that High Court challenge to whether he was there. And this is important, isn't it, Bernard, on who will replace him? Yeah, we don't know who's going to replace him because we don't know whether he was legally uh, entitled to be there in the first place. If he wasn't legally entitled to be there, the consequences of that are very different to what would happen if, uh, well, as has now happened, he gets booted because he's a bankrupt, in which case the Governor of Western Australia would just appoint a replacement from One Nation. So th everything <laughs> depends on that High Court challenge in terms of who we end up with uh, representing uh, Western Australia in, uh, uh, in the Senate. Uh, after uh, after after now, so and, yeah. and I mean Rod, that's and that's and that's Rod's um, 
that's Rod's political career all done and dusted. Didn't take very long, but um, oh, that'd be uh, one of the quickest. More. <laughs> Rachel Backensdale the from quickest. the yeah, Rachel Backensdale from the Australian newspaper joins us now. Rachel, uh, yes, it was quick. Blink and you missed Rod Cullerton. Uh, what's the feeling there? Uh, what's going to happen now? I mean, the gallery. It's meant to be the quiet time. It's very busy, isn't it? It is meant to have the quiet time, be the quiet time. We've had Collison today. We've got Centrelink happening. We've got um, more expense scandals. We'll get to that in a middle. About but, expenses. Uh, Rod um, Cullerton, he hasn't spoken out yet, but I think uh, Pauline Hanson will see what she said in a minute. But uh, yeah, what's the betting on what will happen? Look at this stage. It looks likely that uh, he may. Th there are two possibilities. He may. And I think the most likely one, I'm not the resident expert on this, my colleague um, at the Australian, Rosie Lewis, has been covering it a lot more than I have. But I think the feeling at the moment is that he will be replaced by a One Nation candidate. It'll be very interesting to see whether it's his brother-in-law or whether it's someone that Pauline selects. And, Bernard, that's what you were saying. It all depends on that High Court ruling. Uh, if it is the brother-in-law, we're still in for a, a pretty rocky Cullerton ride, aren't we? <laughs> Yeah, this is a brother-in-law that uh, that um, uh, idolises Paul. We Keating. are indeed, so, Janine. Um, Sorry, I wasn't sure uh, whether you were talking a, to me. Given or... One Nation started off as a kind of a party in reaction to the Australia that Paul Keating created, that's uh, going to have a weird sense of the wheel kind of fully turning. But uh, I know we'll sit and we'll sit and wait. This, the, 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 I mean, just stepping back for a second. I mean, the funny thing about all this is this is all the result of Malcolm Turnbull's double dissolution ploy uh, last year. That's given us this, you know, a, a Senate. It, even wilder and wackier than the one that we had before that. And I think uh, a couple of years ago, we were thinking we're never going to see a, a, a Senate as much like the, 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 you know, the cantina in Star Wars uh, ever again. But uh, we got served up something even weirder. And who knows where it'll go. I'll just read you. Pauline Hanson has tweeted about the news. She says, uh, if a casual vacancy is declared because of Rod Cullerton's disqualification, I have already chosen a great person to replace him in the Senate, who I'm assuming is not the brother-in-law. Rachel, any tips on who it is? No tips on who <laughs> it is, but I would be willing to put money on it not being the brother-in-law. And not James Ashby, Bernard? Um, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I, the, I think James Ashby would, uh, uh, w he, he at some point, would like to grace the red leather or maybe even the green leather, but uh, uh, not sure that that would be uh, that now is his time. Particularly given he seems to be embroiled in a open warfare with half the uh, <laughs> half the uh, One Nation Party. What do you make of the One Nation implosion there, Bruce? As a veteran, as I kept calling you, you've well, been around the block a few times. Exactly, <laughs> and uh, I. I worked on Peter Beattie's campaign in 1998, which saw, you know, the first big souffle rise of uh, One Nation and then it collapsed within about 12 months as, you know, one poor fellow committed suicide and others were thrown out and, and Beattie was able to secure a majority in his own right very quickly. So, uh, it, look, I, I think... She we, seems we'll a lot see... more disciplined and savvy, yeah, politically so they savvy say, this time. So they say. But, yeah, I don't see any great sign in the candidates uh, that there is real, I guess, party discipline. And we may turn our noses up at party discipline from time to time, but then we see what the, you know, the obverse of it is. Uh, well, you know, that's not always a very pretty side either. Well, Pauline Hanson actually bought into the whole expenses scandal today. Before we get what she said, I'll just bring you up to date the latest one. Susan Lay still in trouble, more allegations. Today it's that she um, spent 13000 on private planes because she has a pilot licence. The inference is that she was trying to keep her hours up. But I think an even more extraordinary one coming out is that she spent 83000 on private flights in five months in 2015. Meanwhile, um, the very very hard-working and busy Foreign Minister Julie Bishop has become embroiled over a $2,700 she charged to taxpayers for the polo uh, in Portsea. That's on this weekend. I bet they'll have a lot more people covering that this weekend to see if she goes along. So this prompted Pauline Hanson to uh, make these comments today on the whole expenses scandal. They should pay back the monies that is not, is not you know, legitimate, but not in that, a heavy fine heavily find the politicians that have done the wrong thing. Well, I mean, I think if anyone has a right to talk about this, it's Pauline Hanson who went to jail <laughs> over what she did with, with taxpayers' money and she was exonerated. So I can see she feels very strongly about people who wrought the system. 
She's interesting because she said they should pay the money back. Well, they do, and I think that's getting off lightly. A heavy fine? Yeah, how heavy? It's not there. Rachel, um, what is the latest on the rorting scandal, and are they going to get more than a tap on the wrist and a minor fine and pay the money back? Uh, look, I don't... I, you know, it's a nice line from Pauline Hanson <laughs> about the fine, but I can't see it happening. Another... It was interesting... You know that Pauline's had personal experience of this. Another person who's had personal experience of this is uh, the disgraced former speaker Peter Slipper, who was prosecuted for uh, Comcar trips to Canberra wineries previously. And I think he tweeted today that he <laughs> wants to see uh, MPs and senators exposed to as much scrutiny as he was. Um, I mean, I guess it's a bit of a case of the pot calling the kettle black, but interesting... Oh, there's been a lot of that going on this week. Bronwyn Bishop comes to <laughs> Indeed. mind. Yes, Indeed. no, no. Uh, yeah, I, I saw the, uh, the Peter Slipper tweet. I thought uh, he was probably justified. Um, Bernard, what are you making of the latest? Are we... I don't think Susan Lee's looking too flash today. I'm, I'm not, I doubt she's... There's talk... You certainly talk to Libs behind the scenes. They don't think she's coming back to her portfolio. Yeah, I think some of that's uh, motivated by ambition rather than a, a objective analysis. But, look, things do look a bit grimmer for Susan Lee. And full disclosure, she's a friend of mine, um, than they did uh, a few days ago. Um, but, I mean, look, with, with all of... With all of, the rela all, all of the revelations about Susan Lee, I mean, she's usually going to do some work. Now, the, the, the issue about Julie Bishop is she's going to a polo match and she says, well, I'm there as a Minister for Foreign Affairs. What earthly reason is there for a Minister for Foreign Affairs to be at a polo match? I mean, come on, you know, and this, you know, we come back to the Peter Dutton and George Brandis getting a, uh, and a couple of others getting a, okay. uh, a free ride to, um, to the Prime Minister's New Year's Eve bash, Matthias <laughs> Cormann um, uh, going to the footy. I mean, this idea of using taxpayers' money to go and engage in what are basically social events, um, however tenuously you can connect them to your day job, um, is really got to be something that needs to be cracked down on. The current... Well, the idea is the principal reason for the travel has got to be work-related. Well, I reckon uh, we should be have a much tighter definition around that. So well, the that government no has said that ambiguity. They, the government has said that they're going to tighten up what is. But, look, I think Julie Bishop spends most of her time on planes and has very little time, so you don't begrudge her that. But um, I do wonder... I mean, you must have seen this over the years. Well, I, I remember the early days... <coughs> Howard government, where minister after minister started getting caught in trouble, wrought allegations, and it started to knock on the prime minister's door. <coughs> and and that was when they really started to decide that they had to draw a line under all this, otherwise they're going to start running out of cabinet members. And uh, this can happen, you know, when you start drilling into some of these expenses, all of which are, are now uh, accessible through freedom of information and other legislation, you are going to find these examples. And, you know, and it really just astounds and me... And to be that, fair... Sorry, go well, It just astounds me that politicians these days don't recognise that whatever the technical, you know, rules might be, <clears throat> it's just not going to satisfy either the media or the public when it comes to their attention that, you know, that they are going to the polo, you know, on the public tick. That's just not... Good. Well, it's I take the view right. they're already getting free drinks at the New Year's Eve party and whatever, and they're getting access to it. They should be lucky they're getting there because they wouldn't be there otherwise. It's but mean, to be though, fair, isn't it? I mean, it's you know, it's. But mean. to be fair, Bruce, I want to say this is not just liberals. There's no, been allegations no. today about Chris Bowen charging ten thousand for a family trip. All sides are as bad, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, I'm not trying to claim the moral <laughs> high ground on, on behalf of any political party Good. here, I can tell you. Good job. Rachel, um, can we expect any more revelations in the paper tomorrow? Are these coming thick and fast or are they starting to dry up? Are we are we really scraping are the bottom now? <laughs> They are starting to dry up a little bit. Look, put it this way, I was in the office until 9pm Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, tonight I'm here. So, <laughs> um, so, so look, I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't had time to check on Twitter what Annika Smethurst's <laughs> been up to, but, um, but she's, she wasn't still in the office when I left either. No, so, we had her on um, last night. I guess night. that's a she good was... sign for those MPs out there. <laughs> she was being very cagey last night, but she did say she's getting a lot of help from the public crowdsourcing it. Bernard, do you expect any more, or as these things usually do we have a flurry of them and then we move on to something else? Oh, well, we will have a flurry and move on to something else and then the issue will come back. I mean, you know, this will... There will, there will be another travel wrought scandal. It might involve the opposition, it might involve the government 
Um, but there will definitely be another one, and they'll keep being these sort of scandals until there's a comprehensive overhaul. And I don't... I'm, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath to see what the government's actually going to do about this. They've had that report commissioned in the wake of the Bromham Bishop uh, scandal for quite some time. Haven't done anything with it. Matthias Cormann said they were too busy last year to... Um, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, action it. As Cheryl Kerno pointed out, well, geez, there are a lot of days in the Senate where they didn't actually have any work to do at all. Well, they were uh, too... Funny thing to say, <laughs> that they were too busy to, uh, to implement a, a reform package. So mm -hmm. let's, you know, until there's a substantial reform, there's going to be another scandal. It might be tomorrow, it might be next week, it might be next month, but I can guarantee you there will be a scandal. Well, they were too busy attending parties, polos. Yes, that's true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they were very you know. busy. Weddings, parties, anything. Look, just finally, on a more serious topic, um, somebody who did uh, come back from holiday or finished his holiday and popped up was the minister responsible for the Centrelink scandal. What do you call it? Debacle? He says, nothing to see here. Here's Alan Tudge. The important principle here, Laura, is we're trying to ensure that there is integrity in the welfare system, that people are getting the welfare payments that they were due, no more and no less, and our welfare compliance system is aimed at doing just that. OK, Rachel, we've all been waiting for the Minister to intervene and see if this is going to stem this one. Uh, did he succeed today? Look, not really. I don't think there's been any dramatic change to, um, to the opposition that the government's facing or to the um, government's position on this. Effectively, they're saying, you know, that the, I guess, guilty until proven innocent situation stands where they're, um, they're, they're saying that, you know, Labor's accused them of a 20% failure rate um, because 20% of the letters that they're sending out to people are, are to people who can prove that they haven't tried to dodge the system. Um, and um, they're saying, well, no, actually, you know, we've, we're caught 80% of people and, and the fact that we're sort of threatening people with debt collectors for debts that they never had in the first place um, doesn't matter. OK, Bernard, what do you think? Uh, did Alan Tudge's intervention help or hinder today? Oh, he didn't help his cause one iota. I mean, this idea of saying, well, you know, I'm not aware of any problems, <laughs> uh, just inflames matters. And, you know, meanwhile, there's this juxtaposition with, um, with uh, an expenses scandal and perceptions of, of snouts in the trough. I mean, it's a terrible time for, uh, for the government to be boasting about how aggressively it's cracking down on people with a few hundred bucks of debt to Centrelink. Mm. Optics aren't good. It's not a good way to start the year, is it? No, and when you've got to explain you've lost, and there are 30,000-odd explanations potentially out there that they're going to have to give. I mean, if there have been 170,000 of those notices issued and something like 20% of them are wrong, then that adds up to 30,000-plus people who have been wrongly dealt by or dealt with and a potential 30,000 people who are beating their down the doors of the opposition officers to tell them their story. That's the problem for the government. They'll be much better off cutting and running from this one rather than just reading the departmental brief and thinking that's going to convince anybody. Would you recommend Bill Shorten just keeps on holiday? <laughs> keeps the boat going around the world because they're have doing to a turn good job the by moment. themselves, aren't they? <laughs> We're going to leave local politics there. I'm going to thank our panel very much, Bruce Hawker, uh, Rachel Backensdale, who you can read in The Australian tomorrow to keep up to the latest on what's happening, and Bernard Keane, who uh, you can't read in crikey.com, even though crikey.com.au is back after the break, but, Bernard, you've got another week off. It was very nice to see you tonight. <laughs>